Hey guys, it's Ika Flock, Department of Emergency Medicine, coming to you with the ultrasound guided peripheral IV access lecture. Special thanks to my man Steve Leach for much of the slide content. Today we'll talk about how to achieve our goal of getting quick and easy access without complications. But before we learn how to do that, let's take a look at why we use the ultrasound guided approach as opposed to the classic landmark approach. It's been shown to increase success rates, decrease complications, decrease time to access, increase patient safety, as well as satisfaction while decreasing cost. Sounds too good to be true? Well, here's the evidence supporting that claim. In 2005, we first learned that peripheral intravenous access is greatly aided by the use of ultrasound. In this study of patients with difficult peripheral access, we saw that ultrasound guided access had a much higher success rate than the traditional approach of just sticking the patient a bunch more times. Time to access was also greatly decreased by the ultrasound guided approach. The number of punctures were reduced, and this is most likely the main reason why patient satisfaction is so greatly improved in the ultrasound guided group. All right, let's cover the technique aspects. So the ultrasound beam is only about a millimeter thick, which is why it can be difficult to visualize the needle. So we use ring down artifact and soft tissue motion to help with this. Here's an example of ring down artifact. The needle is in fact up here, and then the hyperechoic white lines beneath it are merely ring down artifact. Here's a ring down artifact and cross section. This is the location of the needle, and this is the ring down artifact tail. Here's an example of soft tissue motion. It's a long axis approach, and ideally we would want to see the needle better than this. However, you have a pretty good idea of where you're heading because of the soft tissue motion. So you really want to know where your needle tip is at all times. There's a couple different ways of doing this. Short axis and long axis. Short axis is a cross-sectional approach, and long axis is an in-plane approach. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. In short axis, we obtain a transverse view. We can see adjacent structures. The probe takes up less space, which can be a big advantage when accessing obese patients. And it's much easier to follow the curvy peripheral veins typically used during peripheral venous access. However, it's an out-of-plane approach, which can make it difficult to visualize the needle tip. This series of images will help you understand the difficulty. This is what I'm seeing on the ultrasound machine in short axis. We're imaging the orange plane. I'm not seeing the needle on the screen. I could be superficial within the vessel or deep to it and not know the difference because the orange imaging plane is not intersecting the needle path. Alternatively, I may be seeing this on the screen. There's a white dot within the vessel, but I'm not getting a flash. Usually the problem is that my imaging plane is not in plane with the needle tip, but with the needle shaft. We've gone through posteriorly without realizing it. Instead, what we want to be doing is keeping our ultrasound beam completely in plane with the needle tip. There are a couple of different techniques to help you accomplish this. First, let's cover the 45 degree angle technique. In the 45 degree angle technique, we place the vessel in the center of the screen and measure the distance down to the center of the vessel. In this case, approximately two centimeters. You determine this with the aid of the hash marks on the side of the screen. Counting down the hash marks, we know this is one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters. The number at the bottom right corner of the screen indicates the total depth and will help you determine whether you're dealing with half or full centimeter hash marks. Then we measure back the same distance from the center of the transducer on the skin in this case, two centimeters. We then aim at a 45 degree angle and advance the needle. By the Pythagorean theorem, the needle tip will enter the imaging plane at the same time it will enter the vessel. The move away advanced technique is a powerful way of supplementing this. It's demonstrated perfectly in this video by Justin Cook. You advance the needle until the white dot appears on the screen, then you move the transducer away from you until the white dot disappears from the screen. Then again, you 
advance the needle until the white dot is again apparent on the screen. You go back and forth like this until you've followed your needle tip all the way down into the vessel. Let's magnify what we would be seeing on the screen. Remember, we're going back and forth between moving away the transducer and advancing the needle. Move away, advance. So, advance the needle until it's in plane. Move away with the transducer. Move away, advance, move away, advance. Move away, advance, move away, advance, and we're in. All right, let's talk about long axis. Long axis is an in-plane approach. The main advantage is that, in my experience, you're a lot less likely to go to deep using the long axis approach, that is, a lot less likely to inadvertently penetrate the posterior wall of the vessel and therewith risk doing damage to underlying structures such as arteries, veins, or nerves. However, you cannot see adjacent structures, which makes avoiding them somewhat more difficult. It's also perceived to be more technically difficult by most operators. The probe takes up more space. This is an issue when attempting to establish access in obese patients. Take a look at a long axis approach and note that the needle is inserted just underneath the transducer and the needle path is directly underneath the transducer. And here we are about to aspirate fluid, which signals that we have entered the vessel successfully, of course. From this angle, the needle is advanced until it is seen entering the vessel. Slow down here for dramatic effect. And there she goes. So which approach do we recommend? Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you. It's kind of a case-by-case -case determination. I do personally practice both approaches, and I use them both successfully. My personal, completely not evidence-based recommendation is to start out doing short axis because most people do find that easier. And once you have achieved adequate competency, try incorporating the long axis approach, as in certain situations, this can certainly be advantageous to know. Let's review our equipment needs first. First and foremost, we will be using the linear transducer. It's the highest frequency transducer and provides the best resolution for vascular access. A tachygram should be used to cover the transducer before every vascular access attempt. Most importantly, this will ensure that the patient is being touched with a sterile surface to help prevent infection, but it will also make cleanup a lot easier. Sterile gel should be utilized. Do not use ultrasound gel from large containers. You will also need an IV long enough to reach deep vessels, typically a one and three quarter inch IV. Let's review three quick tips that have greatly improved my peripheral IV success rate. First off, we've already covered, use a one and three quarter inch IV. Either an 18 or 20 gauge IV will suffice. Be sure not to use a short one to one and a quarter inch IV as is commonly used for peripheral venous access. These lines are too short and will slip out. Even if you're able to establish access, likely you'll be called back into the room within 15 minutes for IV failure. So, check your package, make sure you have a one and three quarter inch IV. These are stocked in our department. If you do not have access to these IVs, just ask for an arrow. These radial artery catheterization kits are also 20 gauge, one and three quarter inch IVs, and so identical to our preferred vascular access catheter. My next tip covers order of attack. I recommend scanning for antecubital veins first. You will likely not find a whole lot of these in difficult to access patients because if they had palpable antecubital veins, the nurses would hopefully have already accessed those without calling you for help. Nonetheless, I double check to make sure we're not missing any. Next, I check for the deeper, large named peripheral veins, such as the basilic vein and the cephalic vein. Lastly, and only as a last resort to avoid central line or in a critically ill patient, will I access the brachial vein. Why not use the large, easy to access brachial vein as our first point of access? It is of course because of the higher associated complication risk. The most common complication when introducing an IV is causing IV infiltration and thrombosis of the vessel. In a superficial vein, this is called superficial thrombophobitis and treatment includes ice packs and NSAIDs. In the brachial vein, this is known as a deep venous thrombosis with complications including pulmonary embolism and death. Therefore, 
It's not a great option for our very first stick. Let's review the associated anatomy. It is wise to insert the catheter at least halfway up the forearm or even more proximally. IVs distal to the midpoint of the forearm have a high failure rate during power injection for CT scans and are thus clinically less useful. Therefore, I'll use this cutoff point as my starting point. And I will scan for forearm and antecubital veins from here to here. If I can find one of these, I will access it. If I do not find an antecubital vein, I next search for the cephalic vein located laterally in the arm. It can also be found sometimes running just anterior to the bicep. If this vein cannot be found, I go immediately and just posterior to the brachial veins where the basilic vein runs. The basilic vein typically runs in the bicipital groove. It is very consistent from person to person and a very common site of access. As we've previously discussed, if I can find none of these, I will access the brachial veins in this location. My third and final tip is to use the move away advanced technique to bury the needle within the vessel. That is to keep advancing the catheter inside of the vessel after a flash several more times to ensure that the vein is not pushed off the catheter when you advance the catheter. Let's watch these principles in action. In this case, we have selected the brachial vein as an access point. Here are the paired brachial veins adjacent to the deeper brachial artery and the median nerve located in between the brachial veins. The first step, as always, is to check compressibility. As we exert pressure with the transducer, the veins easily collapse while the artery pulsates. This ensures patency of the veins while also reliably distinguishing the brachial veins from the brachial artery. Now we'll see a combination of 45 degree angle technique and move away advanced technique. The vein is accessed using the 45 degree angle technique. You will see the needle popping into view right as it enters the vessel there. Now we're finishing off with move away advance to ensure that we bury the needle within the vessel prior to advancing the catheter. Burying the needle in this fashion will, in my experience, result in a substantial increase in your success rate. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to our hands-on session. Please write down any questions you may have and I'll answer them at the hands-on session.